welcome Chris to the stage. on here? Good. Um, so I'd like to thank um, Tom and everybody else at Aldebaran. This has just been such a fun and rewarding uh, collaboration that has gone on, uh, especially involving others in the academic community like Matt. Um, so just a, just a correction, I was at the University of Iowa, not Wisconsin. Hard to say. So anyway, um, I've been fortunate that a lot of the other people uh, that have presented have done a really nice job of giving some of the background um, on CRISPR-Cas9 and the use of RNP delivery and that sort of thing. Um, so I'll kind of try to rush through a little bit of that. But I'm going to talk about the um, development of the HiFi variant, and then if there's any time, I'll go into uh, some recent work we've done uh, looking at uh, CPF1, or I guess now called Cas12a. Um, so just some basic background. Uh, I think arguably the two most popular enzymes now are SPCAS9 and ASCPF1 Cas12a. And really we're just using them to introduce a double-stranded break in the genome of living cells uh, towards the aim of either uh, you know, allowing the native repair machinery to in, uh, include an insertion or deletion or include a, a repair template uh, for homology-directed repair. Um, and then most of my talk today is going to center around Cas9. And, uh, you know, we've kind of gone into this a bit with other people's talks. But basically, anywhere in the genome where there's an NGG-PAM sequence, uh, you can target with Cas9 uh, and make a, a successful double-stranded break. Natively in bacteria, this exists as part of an adaptive immune system or a primitive adaptive immune system where you've got two individual RNAs, uh, a universal tracer RNA, uh, and a targeting CRISPR RNA or CR RNA. Um, and these obviously have been uh, co covalently fused as an artificial sDNA that Matt had talked about uh, that can be chemically modified for use uh, in primary cells. So one of the things I think is really fascinating about CRISPR-Cas9 is not only that it works in living cells, but beyond that is just the sheer ver uh, versatility of the system. You can deliver these reagents by any number of different ways. You can purify Cas9 protein directly, uh, deliver that into cells. You can uh, supply it as, as a gene on the eukaryotic chromosome. Um, you can in vitro transcribe the mRNA. You can use a plasmid, lentivirus, et cetera, et cetera. And the same is largely true for the RNA. So it's, so it's really highly versatile. And then sort of what the question that comes from that is, uh, what system do I use? What are the appropriate reagents to use? And I think a lot of that, um, the real answer to that is there's no one-size-fits-all solution. But a lot of it centers around what your application is uh, and how concerned are you about things life, uh, like off-target um, and that's sort of going to be the focus of the talk, is the notion of off-target editing uh, and what you can do about it. And this is an experiment um, from Shang Darsai. It's the, in what is known as the guide-seek technique, and it's the best way available to identify uh, real off-target sites in living cells. And essentially what you do is take a short double-stranded DNA tag uh, that is transfected along with CRISPR-Cas9 reagents, and then that is uh, in inserted in the repair at all the du uh, double-stranded break. And what you can see in this experiment, this is one of the real popular sites to test, the EMX1 locus. Um, you can see at the very top, there's a black-filled square. That indicates the number of NGS reads uh, that come out of the intended on-target site. And obviously, it's a good thing that they get the most reads at this on-target. But what's kind of scary about this is if you look at everything else going down the line, uh, there's a number of different off-target sites that differ at only a few different uh, nucleotide mis. And really, there are a couple of those sites that have nearly the same amount of uh, NGS reads or are edited nearly as frequently. And if you actually sum up the NGS reads from all of those different sites, you find that the amount of off-target editing is equal or greater than on-target editing. So that's, that's sort of a really scary thing, depending on your application, especially in the therapeutic. And what we have found is the extent of off-target editing depends heavily on the, the nature of delivery. And I know a lot of other people that have talked uh, have brought this up. And this is an, an experiment from our friends at Thermo Fisher. And what they've done is to look at the levels of Cas9 uh, when they vary the delivery mechanism, and then also simultaneously look at uh, the extent of off-target editing at two different sites. So on the left panel, you can see with the, the DNA-based plasmid method, uh, it takes actually quite a while for Cas9 to reach a steady state level in the cells. By 24 hours, it's there. But even out to 72 hours, you still have a really high amount of Cas9 in the cell because it's sustained expression. You're continually making more Cas9 mRNA. You're continually translating more Cas9. 
And this, of course, is, is synonymous with the highest level of off-target editing seen in black at those two sites. With mRNA, it's sort of an intermediate phenotype where you have uh, the protein being made a little faster. You don't need to transcribe. All you're doing is translating. But that, again, persists uh, out, and it only starts to dissipate out to around 72 hours. And then using RNP, a ribonucleic protein delivery, you can see it's sort of a fast-on approach where the protein is instantly there, and then that rapidly dissipates out to 72 hours where it's largely undetected. And you can see the, the nice sort of domino effect uh, in blue where the mRNA is lower off target, and then the protein, which is kind of not visible in that red or burgundy color, is synonymous with the lowest level of off-target editing. So at IDT, we, we sort of repeated this experiment in a little bit of a different way. Uh, <clears throat> we actually uh, in integrated the Cas9 gene to make a stable cell line, and we compared the amount of on-target and off-target editing to that of RNP delivery at four different doses. So basically, all we're supplying on that left-hand panel is four micromore of the guide RNA complex. And what we find is that we get really high on-target editing in, in virtually all of these different cases, but the levels of off-target editing at two sites in that light blue and gray color uh, is the highest in the stable cell line. This is a condition where you have a lot of Cas9 that's it's continually re-expressed. And then moving to RNP delivery, you don't have to sacrifice the on-target editing levels to dramatically reduce off-target editing. And in fact, you can titrate the RNP down quite a bit to even reduce that further. And it's only at that very low half micromolar dose where you really start to reduce the amount of on-target editing. And sort of what we found is that um, this is a really good strategy to reduce off-target editing, but it's not a complete solution. There are certain cases where um, we have these really nasty off-target sites that are very challenging to beat. Um, so the onus has been on us to sort of figure out a way uh, to further reduce off-target editing. And I think the simplest way to do this would be able to uh, select a guide RNA uh, that just doesn't facilitate as much off-target editing. And this has sort of become a dated slide, I think. Uh, but these were uh, some of the first two predictive algorithms uh, to help you choose guide RNAs with low off-target editing. And we evaluated these as well as a number of others at IDT. And what we've done is we've, we've shown all of the, the true off-target sites are all the squares represented with these different algorithms. And the ones that are filled in green uh, are ones that these algorithms actually successfully predict. And the problem, and you should know, we actually tested our own as well, and it has its own failings. And what we found with this is sort of a mis mixed bag. And I'll use our own as an example. If you look at the IDT algorithm, it doesn't report as many sites. It only reports about 100 total sites. So that's something that's more manageable to evaluate in a laboratory setting. But the unfortunate part of that is that some of those very frequently edited sites at the top are missed by this algorithm. And the alternative from that is if you look at the CRISTA algorithm, it actually shows a lot of those true off-target sites, but it also reports uh, 1 to 2,000 sites. So that's something that you couldn't really easily look at in laboratory. And this is some of that data uh, just showing you um, that for all the different algorithms. So I think that there's a lot of room for improvement uh, with off-target algorithms, and we're really just not quite there yet. So what else can you do? So RNP can be used to limit off-target editing. It's not a total solution. Other things that have uh, crept up in the literature would be reducing the length of the targeting RNA, 18 to 19 MERS. And we've kind of found this is a mixed bag. Uh, oftentimes, you sacrifice on-target editing at the expense of reducing OTEs. The same is basically true for chemical modification. And the last thing that's cropped up are the idea of uh, specifically evolved Cas9 variants uh, that have higher specificity. And the first two examples, and actually have been a lot of things that have come out recently, but the first two examples involve the idea of using rational mutagenesis. Uh, the first is the ESP Cas9 1.1 protein from Fang Zhang's lab, and the second being the ESP Cas9 HF1 from Keith Young's lab. And basically all they did is look at the crystal structure of Cas9 uh, in, in complex with the RNA and target site, and try to make uh, amino acid substitutions that reduce the affinity for one of the target genes. Sort of a very clever idea uh, in hopes that you would uh, eliminate the interaction with the lower affinity off target. Um, so what we wanted to do at IDT is we had, uh, a couple of years ago, just released our first wild type Cas9 protein to the market. And we were aware of this problem of off target editing. And we thought that we could test these variants and possibly commercialize them. And what I would note about these is they were made uh, under conditions where you had plasmid expression, 
of both Cas9 and the RNA. So you had continual expression of them, and Cas9 and the RNAs were very, very high. So maybe it's then not that surprising that what we ultimately found uh, was that you start to lose on-target editing with some of these different guys. So on the left-hand panel are some of the most commonly tested literature-derived sites. And what we find is with the hex site 4 and VEGFA3 site, you uh, see a considerable loss uh, in on-target editing with RNP delivery. And on the right-hand side, it, we decided to take a broader survey with guides that we tested internally, and we found that the problem is actually much worse than we thought. Um, these things were effectively useless for RNP delivery, and we didn't ultimately commercialize them. And I would just point out that, you know, this isn't really a failing of these two efforts. It's more that we tested them in a way that they were never designed to be tested. They were made for plasmid-based uh, delivery of both protein and guide, and that's not what we were looking for. And we didn't want to use uh, plasmid delivery because of the issues with uh, toxicity in the immune system. So we, we didn't have an existing high-fidelity variant that worked well. Um, and so I came to the company about three and a half years ago. Um, and my background was in microbiology. I'd done a lot of genetic screens, transposon hunts, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought that we could use bacteria to duly select for the maintenance of on-target editing and simultaneous reduction in off-target. Um, so this is the screen that uh, actually was in the Nature Medicine paper. And just to quickly walk through it, um, on the, on the left-hand side, what you have is a high-copy plasmid that expresses a, a toxin that will kill bacterial cells if it's induced. And on this plasmid, is a single on-target site, and what you're asking Cas9 to do is cleave every single one of those on-target plasmids so that the organism can survive. The second part of the screen is a second plasmid that has a known off-target site for the particular guide that is being used, as well as an antibiotic marker. So the basic concept is you have to cleave the on-target plasmids to survive, and you have to avoid cleaving the off-target plasmids to survive. And this is a metric that the wild-type Cas9 protein cannot uh, cannot achieve, the organism just died. So what we did was we made a, a mutagenic library of Cas9 using low fidelity PCR. We screened a quarter of a million different colonies. We came up with a, a pool of, of uh, hits from this screen. We changed the on and off target sites for, to use a different guide, put the candidate hits we had right back through it, ended up with around 160 different mutants that represented 100 different amino acid positions, and then we went and tested these in human cells with plasma. Um, so the results of that are on the left and right. So the EMX1 guide, we find that that's sort of a low stringency guide. It's very easy off-target site to beat. And we found that there were several different mutants that came up uh, that beat that particular off-target site. On the right is the hex site 4 guide. This, is an, this has an off-target site that we find is very challenging to beat. And you can see that only a handful of those mutants uh, gave a, a large reduction in off-target editing and maintained on-target potency. So we took the best from this list, and we tested them a little more carefully, now with plasma delivery on top and RNP delivery on bottom. And what we find is uh, a couple of these mutations, the arginine 691 to serine and asparagine 692 to aspartate mutations, really stood out as ones where you had high on-target editing and significantly reduced off-target editing. And there were a couple others that that stood out as well. And we purified all of these and tried different combinations and stacked them on top of one another. And we looked very carefully with RNP delivery uh, at on-target editing at two different sites. Uh, the site that's indicated in blue on this uh, bottom panel is a guide that's very, very robust. Even proteins that don't edit as well seem to give high editing with this site. And then the second site in green uh, is the HBRT38509 site. It is a very weak guide. So it's very good at discriminating very subtle differences in non-target. And then in between those two guides are different off-target sites for that hex site four guide. So we're looking for blue and green to stay high, and we're looking for everything else to go down. And what you can immediately see from this is anytime we stacked any of these mutations, double mutations, triple mutations, we would rapidly lost on-target editing at either the weak or both sites. So we didn't end up going forward with any of those. Some of the mutations we picked were very weak effects. They had really good on-target editing, but they didn't do much to reduce off-target editing. And what we ended up with ultimately were the same two mutations that we originally thought were going to be the best, the 691 and 692 mutations. And we always saw a modest reduction in editing when we looked at the 692 mutation as uh, compared to the 691. So ultimately what we went forward with and what became the HiFi Cas9 protein uh, is the arginine 691 alanine sub. Um, so that's what ultimately became the commercial product. 
We rigorously looked at the on-target editing performance with this. Uh, we compared it to RNP delivery of uh, the, the two proteins I talked of before, and then a third one had come out while we were working this from Jennifer Doudna's group, this hypocast variant. We purified all those, tested them wild type versus our hi-fi, and we found at all these 12 sites in HBRT, this time we've moved on to NGS, we've gotten a little more sophisticated. We find that the hi-fi Cas9 performs the best, and then in the aggregate you can see on the right-hand side uh, with the box and whiskers plot, the green hi-fi Cas9 is, is clearly the winner. But if I'm going to show you something that um, supposedly reduces off targets, I'd better uh, show you that it does it in a global fashion. Um, so we stepped up to produce a slightly different technique to do this. And traditionally, we've used GuideSeq. And what we find uh, is a problem with GuideSeq is it's very good at identifying uh, what the total edited sites are in the cell. But where it fails is giving you an accurate, accurate quantitation of the level of editing at each one of those sites. Um, so the way we solved that problem is we first used GuideSeq to tell us what the sites were, and then we used uh, some of our proprietary RAMPSeq chemistry to do multiplexed NGS sequencing at each one of those sites in a single pot reactor. So we did an editing experiment with four different guides listed at the bottom, one of which is the beta globin 1 uh, gene that Matt Porteous talked about. And then we used this RAMPSeq based two step approach uh, to look at the total repertoire of editing. Uh, in the cell. And this is one example. This is simply looking at EMX1. And what it's kind of hard to see, but on the left hand side is the orange on target editing. You can see it's near 100% for all these conditions. And we not only looked at RNP, we also generated a stable cell line for wild type and then a hi fi one. So it's the exact same cell line, just a single point mutation in the Cas9 gene. And you can see that even in the context of stable expression, uh, the overall level of off target editing goes dramatically down such that on-target editing is 97% of the total editing found. And then if we look at RNP delivery, blocked by that heck, but if you look at RNP delivery, uh, with the HiFi variant, the off-target editing goes down to less than 1% of total editing. And it's basically the same, should be the same, there. Basically the same story uh, for all the different guides we looked at, and I would point out including that HBB site, uh, which has at least one very nasty off-target site. And Matt did a really nice job of going through all this, so I'll kind of skip through this so I can talk about what I'm really excited about now. But uh, this is an amalgamation of data that Matt's, uh, Danny Dever in, in Matt's lab did, showing you that what we showed for the HPRT locus with on-target performance is essentially the same in primary cells at clinically relevant loci. Uh, so the hi fi variant works really, really well. And then the penultimate experiment of being able to do disease correction with the hi fi variant and simultaneously reduce off target editing. And that, of course, resulted in, in the, the Nature Medicine paper with Matt's lab. Um, so, just to summarize the hi fi uh, info, the, simply switching to RNP delivery does quite a bit to mitigate off target risk. Um, you don't have to use plasma uh, based methods. Uh, RNP can eliminate some, but not all, really nasty off target sites. And in these cases, we recommend using the HiFi variant. And then lastly, I think is really exciting is that this uh, Aldevron SPI5 version of the HiFi mutant uh, is going to be available this month uh, for GMT applications. And I, uh, Tom promised to show me, possibly behind a glass wall, show me the vials sometime. OK, so what I wanted to move on and just give a quick glimpse on here is some work that we've done uh, with Cas12A or CPF1. And when I started doing the hi-fi work, you know, we were kind of a one-man band, and now we've uh, put some money behind this effort. And I think we've really gotten a lot more sophisticated with what we can do. And to give a little more background on Cas12A, uh, it's similar to Cas9, except for a few key differences. One is that it's natively a single-guide RNA-based system, a very short CRRNA. And I think the most important difference is the PAM sequence is actually a triple TV, and it's located on the five prime end of the target site as opposed to the three prime. And when we started working with Cas12A, uh, what we found is that the quadruple T-based PAM sites do not work at all. There are only a handful of them that work, and we looked at a lot of different sites. And you can actually see that the, the triple TA seems to work best. And our ultimate goal with this protein was to make it as usable as SPCAS9 is. Um, so we started off in different steps. And the very first step was, was simply telling people don't use the quadruple T PAMs. So if we have a number of different sites in orange for Cas9, that's sort of how well the vast majority of those guides work. 
And if we look at Cas12a, in blue is if we tell people to use the triple TN, so all the different PAM combinations. And simply subtracting out quadruple Ts moves us over to the left in the gray. So that on its own uh, helped us improve the use of this system. And another thing that's sort of simple and intuitive that we did to improve it was simply to make it so that it was delivered into cells better. We made changes to the nuclear localization signals and the various amino acid linkers in this protein to make it a more effective deliverable. And in the interest of time, I won't show some of that data. Um, but the end result is that if we look at, again, a lot of different sites in, uh, with our first offering in blue and orange and compare it to our later offering when simply just changing everything on the ends, you can see a huge shift in performance of this enzyme. And then the box and whiskers plot on the right is sort of an aggregate. So simply messing with the ends helped improve it dramatically. Um, but we wanted to take it a step further. And some, some of the problems we noticed with this enzyme is it just seems to be uh, lower activity than Cas9. Um, and again, the quadruple T PAM site seemed to be basically unusable. And this is another case where I thought we could step in with protein engineering and protein evolution uh, and make it work better, make it higher activity, and possibly enable the use of quadruple T PAM site. Um, so I mentioned our, our strategy got more sophisticated. Basically, what we did this time is to, again, use the broad approach of using low-fidelity PCR, identify regions that are very important for improving activity, and then take a second step of uh, saturation mutagenesis and really beat the living daylights out of the protein in a very narrow focus. And then we coupled all this to NGS before we were just using Sanger's. And I'll start to show some of the data here. Uh, this is a cartoon of how the, the screen works. It's actually less complicated than the Cas9 screen. We don't have any off-target business. We're simply asking uh, CPF1 uh, to cleave all the on-target site plasmids that carry a quadruple T-PAM uh, containing target. And on the bottom hand side, uh, this shows you what the screen actually looks like. So we induce the toxin to make it work. Um, and on the left hand side is a, a working triple TC PAM. On the right hand side is a quadruple T PAM. And minus toxin tells you everything that successfully transformed or everything that could have survived. And on the right hand side, that gives you all the uh, events where a successful CRISPR cleavage occurred. So with triple TC PAMs, you can see we get a number of colonies on the right hand side indicating that it worked really well, but with the quadruple TPAM, even in bacteria, it doesn't work that well. I mean, that was sort of surprising to us, and that's actually background levels if we just did a, a control with no guide that we'd get around. Um, so I, I kind of had a, a back and forth fight with the legal team about what I could and couldn't show, and this is sort of all I was able to show. Um, but this is one mutant that sort of gave us the properties that we were looking for. Um, so, on the top panel is the wild type CPF1 enzyme. Again, it's showing you this works with triple TC. It does not work very well with quadruple T. But if we look at this one mutant uh, that's cleverly boxed out with white boxes, um, you can see that we now see vastly improved performance at quadruple T PAMs and even a hint of higher activity overall on uh, more usable PAM sites. And as I mentioned, we coupled all this to NGS and we do several rounds of mutagenesis. So we'll find uh, pools of mutants that give us the activities we look for. We'll pool them together, throw them right back into bacteria, and do this around five times, sequence the results, and we find enrichment in a number of different positions and specific amino acid substitutions. And it's a lot of work to uh, put these things into cells. So generally what we like to do is do an enzymatic assay to ask do they have the properties we're looking for before subjecting them to a lot of work in cells. Um, so what we're looking at here is enzymatic cleavage in vitro of a quadruple T PAM containing target site. We're looking at two different mutants that came out of the bacterial screen. And what I would highlight is that 30 nanomolar uh, dose in green. And you can see with the wild type enzyme, that 30 nanomolar dose starts to fall off. And if you look at our mutant one on the bottom left, you can see it creeps back up. The same is true for mutant two, albeit not as well. And if we couple them together, that dose is right on top of the other line. So we had a good indication that what we thought was true is true uh, in an in vitro setting. And we next moved this into cells since we were convinced we had something we wanted. And this is the result of a lot of work uh, looking in HEC-293 cells with RNP delivery. And we parsed this out so we're looking at all of the different PAMs uh, on the left-hand side, the quadruple T PAMs alone in the middle, and then all the PAMs minus quadruple Ts on the right. And I've got our extremely pitiful version one offering of 
of CPF1 in green. You can see it doesn't work very well uh, with a lot of sites. Um, our V3 offering, that's the offering where all we did was change the nuclear localization signals, everything on the ends. You can see that dramatically improves the performance, especially at the triple TV sites. And then we've got those two mutants, and what I think is so interesting about those is mutant one seems to improve cleavage at quadruple TPAMs. You can see that in the V3 offering, all those are, the vast majority of those are effectively zero, and that mutant one brings them uh, up to, in fact, I don't think there are any zero data points. However, mutant two seems to do a better job of helping non-quadruple sites. And we were surprised to find out that we could, in fact, couple those two sets of mutations together to get what we ultimately are going to call the V4 Castrol Bay offering, uh, which has dramatically improved performance. Um, so to conclude, I know I'm a little over here. Um, we had two main problems with this enzyme. It seemed to be relatively low enzymatic activity. Quadruple T PAMs didn't seem to do very well. I think through a combination of protein engineering as well as directed evolution, uh, we've been able to enable both of these things. We've got a higher activity enzyme. We've got something that works with quadruple TAMs. Um, and I, with some hope, I think that that's going to end up being a, a new commercial product sometime in the next year. So um, with that, I'd like to thank, um, obviously, everybody at Aldevron, everybody involved in the HiFi project, including Matt's group and others, um, and everybody in my group. And with that, I'll take Thanks, thanks, Chris, for the great talk, and I uh, really appreciate the, the partnership. Um, and I'm going to try to see if uh, I can see a tour of the GMP spy if I will take it, uh, on the tour, uh, come through with my, my promise there. A um, couple, of, couple of questions that I have, and um, it looks like it's really hard to see. Do you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, ask your question. Does Cas9 target specificity change depending on the cell or tissue type that's being edited? Or off targets change the frequency? We haven't seen that. So, so there were two things that came up when we were looking at this. Is one is does the repair outcome change uh, at any site? Is the repair profile different? And then are the off targets different? Um, and unless you know you've got a situation where you've got a SNP that makes something a better off target site. We haven't really seen any differences, but admittedly, we haven't looked at a, a huge survey of different cells. So, you know, as far as we've looked, uh, the answer to that is no. Great talk. I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about the mutants that didn't work out so well um, and stability issues and maybe other issues that um, are challenging when you try to do the screen in a bacterial system and then translate it to maybe human cells or biophilized product? Yeah, so one thing that had come up that I, I guess I didn't anticipate is, um, maybe this isn't quite related, but it is the downstream storage potential of these things outside of a living cell. And we found that uh, if we had things that had three, four, five mutations, uh, oftentimes they wouldn't be nearly as stable even outside of the cell. Um, so six months later, we would find out they'd have no enzymatic activity, and right from the get-go, they seemed to be. So that's one one big thing that came up that I didn't anticipate. Um, so now for all of our uh, evolution programs, be it you know, the Hi-Fi or now the Castrol A, we've got to sort of go back with everything, purify it, uh, and find out, is this thing stable over the long term? Which, as you can imagine, is kind of a challenge. Or encouraged to launch that. I have a couple of questions here. Um, I'd be interested to see if you could comment um, with the, the one amino acid substitution. Um, it has a slightly different function, right, as it interacts with the guide and, and the DNA. I was wondering if you can comment um, on, you know, maybe what your hypothesis is and on why do you see then specifically less off target? Um, is it, does it have to do more with the enzyme, the guide, the site? Yeah, so that, I mean, that's a really tricky one because um, I, I've seen a couple different answers to that. So we have not specifically looked at that in-house. Um, we've been trying to encourage some people that do crystallographic studies to, to take a peek at the enzyme, but it's not something we're actively working on. Um, but one thing that's come up is uh, I've seen at one talk somebody had presented that they looked at a lot of these different high-fidelity mutations, including ours, and that person had believed that these enzymes all have reduced affinity for the target site. 
And the reason that the off-target sites drop off is they're inherently lower than the on-target site. But in contrast, uh, Jennifer Doudna's HypaCast9 actually includes that 692 mutation that we found. And in her paper, uh, what she had found is that uh, the enzymes don't have reduced affinity for, for DNA. They actually get locked in a uh, cleavage incompetent state. So they can't sort of reach over to that next form. And I kind of hard to know, you know, what's really going on without specifically looking. Maybe uh, one other question here. It, it sounds like Cas12A is your new favorite project, so I thought I might have to. It's not a consensus. <laughs> um, so you talked about the triple uh, TA um, PAM site and, and the difference from um, Cas9 specifically around that. With, with the, the difference in the PAM site from a genome standpoint, can you share with the, the audience here how that might open up a whole range of new diseases maybe that might be addressed um, that wouldn't have been able to be addressed with either the high fidelity, Wi-Fi or wild type? Yeah, so um, one of the things that has been in demand is uh, the agriculture industry because obviously plants are more AT rich and a PAM that's exclusively peas um, is going to be something that's you know, obviously useful to them. Um, alternatively, anywhere in the human genome where you've got an AT-rich se uh, segment could be a, a potential target for Cas12 a whereas it may not be for, for Cas9. But I think the other thing that had come up is the notion that uh, Cas12 a is natively lower off-target than Cas9. You can use it right out of the box without trying to involve a high variant, um, and it's going to be much lower off. I mean, that's, that's something we've looked at um, in-house, and we find that sort of is true for the wild-type uh, Cas12 a. Um, and to a lesser extent, the evolved Pyrex. Um, I think we'll uh, go to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Chris, and uh, appreciate your, uh, your presentation.